All right, I think we're live. There it goes. Uh, okay. Cool. Um, so, hey, everybody, I'm Brian Kinslow. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, and i uh, one of the co-owners of Oval Flagstaff. We're in Flagstaff, Arizona, and we help uh, help athletes get out of pain, improve their nutrition, and uh, we're talking with, with Craig Smith. Craig, you want to give us just a quick intro? Yeah, my name's uh, Craig Smith. I am one of the owners of Smith Performance Center with wife in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, I'm sitting here with uh, Jesse. Hi, I'm Jesse Buczek. Uh I'm a professional triathlete, and I'm the owner and head coach of Top Step Training. Yep. And, uh, cool. And so we're, we're just going to talk today about IT band syndrome and uh, to generally how it relates to running, but uh, we wanted to get on and talk about this today because it's a problem that a lot of runners have and can last sometimes for years. It's, it can be tough to diagnose, tough to treat, um, and uh, we... Greg and I see it commonly, or see, Becca, we see pain on the outside of the knee, the, the lateral knee commonly. And so that's an area that we we really are interested in differential diagnosis, treatment. Um, and then Jesse's had struggled with uh, pain on the outside of the knee, IT band pain for a long time, and I think has gotten gotten through it for the most part. And so I think his experience would be really valuable to, to talk about. Sound, sound good? I think that sounds good. Yeah. I think I think one of the big things that we we're definitely interested in showing today is that the uh, the answer is not when we talk about T band pain or like lateral pain, and the uh, you know I think it's also valuable to see that somebody of Jesse's caliber can also experience those type of symptoms and be frustrated by it, but at some point you can you can get through it. So is it, should we start with having just Jesse kind of talk about the experience? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so for a couple of, couple of seasons in a row, it seemed like every time I started really ramping up my intense running, I would start to get this um, in my IT band, like where it connects to me and kind of radiating, radiating up there. Um, and then for like two years, the strategy I had was to just get like work done on it. Um, and I tried various techniques from various different like providers. Um, but it was really just kind of managing the symptoms of that. And it would get me through a season, and I'd have to, like, back off intensity at various times to compensate for that. Um, well, we're talking about, like, serious volume, though, when you would just really start to ramp up because you were in Ironman training. Yeah, so, I mean, running-wise, I mean, if you just isolate the running, I'd be only, like, maybe over 40 miles a week, maybe 50. Okay. Um, so not insane on a running yeah. front, but total hours would be pretty which, high. Which to him is not insane. So well, compared yeah. to my wife, who when she gets running a lot, she's running a hundred miles a week. Yeah, no, that's true. So, I mean, she's not biking or swimming. Um, true. Okay. Do you have like a threshold above which it would it would start hurting more, or uh, could you keep it manageable at a lower volume? I think for me, the biggest instigator was intensity. I could okay. get through easy running, and you know, I could easy run eighty miles a week, and that'd be fine. Uh, but the real trick yeah. is when I wanted to get race ready and I started doing um, like anything kind of faster than like a tempo effort, like if I'm hitting the track or, you know, mile repeats, anything like that yeah. would kind of be the real aggressor. Uh, okay. But I, I kind of feel like I need that for fitness. So trying to ride that line of like what I can get away with and what I can't. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's tough. Uh, okay. What, what helped you finally get past it? Do you know? Uh, I mean, not to just be like a giant commercial, um, <laughs> but I started lifting weights. Uh, I mean, I came here, and like really that was when I stopped getting the symptoms. It was like the next year, um, you know, I just, it just never came back. Like I did an Ironman in like November a couple of years ago, and I was in a lot of pain after, and I took a break from running, and then I started lifting after that, and then in going to that spring season, I was kind of like waiting for it to happen, waiting for it to happen. And then it basically like never came back. Like, you know, I've had a few like minor symptoms, yeah, um, but it's been like much more easily managed. And there hasn't been that time where I need to say, oh, I need to stop running. I need to go on like a serious regimen of like Advil. That hasn't happened again. Yeah. Um, since I started lifting. Yeah. I would say the, the, even when you had the increase in volume, we didn't have any, Recurrence, right? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've had an increase in volume. I've had and a massive intensity. increase in intensity. Yeah, and like volume beyond where I've ever gone before. Um, 
and and w with the same intensity that I've done, yeah, um, if not higher. Cool. That I think yeah. we might talk about more later, but that, that kind of fits with my philosophy of what the, the pathophysiology injury and treatment is that you know with lifting weights, you're improving your ability to, to tolerate eccentric loading and absorb force. And then if you think of it as kind of a tendon ligament structure, you know that gets stiffened and strengthened with with weight training more so than I think with running. So. Um, I mean, I think that is the thing that's interesting about the IT band. And, and so, like, I think when we talk about it, and, and I know that when I think of the IT band structure, I, I'm always thinking of something that's passive. And, and that's why IT band syndrome, just as a diagnosis, has always made me uncomfortable. Because I've yeah. never, no. a single time have I thought of IT band as an actual pain generator. Like, I don't think of it as, like, something that's actually causing pain. Yeah. You know? And, you well, know, like, when we, You never get pain in, like, the lateral mid thigh where the bulk of the IT band is, you know, that area rarely even gets sore. It's always down by the knee. Yeah. yeah. Well, unless somebody has like a contusion or something, I, it just doesn't seem to be the main cause of, of symptoms. And I, I think it's just such a, it's a, such a large structure and it goes down and it's interesting. It goes pa past the, the leg. We have tests for it to say if it gets tight. Yeah. It just, that thought process really makes sense to me, to yeah. be honest. You know? Yeah. Um, so what are some of the differential diagnosis things that, I mean, there's a few I could name off the top of my head, but what kind of things do you see commonly on the outside of the knee? Sorry, can I ask a quick yeah, question first? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to understand, you're saying that, like the IT band isn't actually like ever the driver of the problem, right? It's just something else is like affecting the IT band because in and itself yeah. usually has nothing wrong with it. So, yeah. So like, so how, how my, how our minds work, honestly, so Brian and I have, like talk about this stuff a lot, but. When we when we look down, we try to figure out first what's the pain generator. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're saying that the pain generator is the IT band, I don't see that. So I'm saying that like when I'm thinking of somebody that has lateral knee pain, like what goes through my mind are couple couple things. The primary one is a lateral meniscus. Like if the meniscus, the knee joint, is actually irritated or torn or something like right. that, it can mimic it. Biceps femoris, popliteus, like a snapping tendon. Um, proximal tip fib joint. I, I would say all of those are more common. And, and I've, I honestly, I, I just can't say that like me palpating the IT band without pushing so hard that I'm compressing on the tissue underneath has ever been painful. And I mean, that kind of speaks to, I mean, we were talking about that earlier about if it's like a bursa yeah. or a fat mat that's underneath, like a piece of fat tissue that's underneath the IT band. But still, it's not the IT band in my opinion. It's like the IT band compressing. Uh, tissue underneath it, like maybe even the vastus lateralis. Like yeah, the vastus lateralis, or you can even get a little bit of the LCL in there too. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, well, that's what I think is so interesting is it's, it's this term that's really commonly used, IT band syndrome, but it's the, the pathophysiology is not clear. The research is all over the place. But that's when you're only considering the IT band and not considering some of these other differential diagnoses. I think Jesse hit it on the head, though. I mean, if anybody has lateral knee pain, they call it IT band syndrome. Or they say it's my IT band. I have a tight yeah. IT band. Yeah. And uh, I just as a differential, it's not it's not like a a high one for me. Even though if you look at any of the literature, I mean, it's it's the second most common cause cause of knee pain in any runner. Yeah. I mean, that's I think that's been repeated in a couple of studies as a pretty common number. And I just I mean, it takes me back to saying syndrome. Like if somebody says syndrome. And what it, what it think what it comes to my head is it means that you don't have a clear pain generator. Yeah, it's a collection of different things to make you say, "Oh, this person has IT band syndrome." Which yeah. is like, well, what what does that mean even? Yeah, yeah. And I have had a couple cases where they're on the table. You can flex your hip a little bit with the knee straight, internally rotate, and then the IT band and the distal insertion pops out. And palpating that is painful, but it, it's not clear if you're pressing on something underneath it, um, or if that pain is referred from somewhere because it's not always reliable in the knee. Um, yeah, it's, I, I mean, that's, I guess that's a, that's a struggle to me. And, yeah. and so like, if you push on it, are you pushing through to the tissue that's underneath it? Yeah. Or if it's the, the band itself? And yeah. I mean, I guess at the, at, in the end of it, I, I do think that understanding that component of it's important. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, the, uh, the old mindset that, uh, was it the Fredrickson article? Friedrichsen, the one where they, they came up with the IT band friction syndrome and they talk about it 
and the old way that we used to look at it, it was the IT man would like, because you can see it like moving. Actually, I'm gonna bring up a video real quick, Brian, okay. of, uh, of Jesse that we just did, just running, just so you can see what I'm talking about with him, with it kind of moving across the, uh, across the knee. Um, let's see if we can get that. I'm going to share my screen real quick, okay? Yep. Oh, can you see that? Yep. Okay, so I'm just going to slow it down a little bit. Even there, still kind of seeing it, but... Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, it's right there. On the mid-thigh all the way down, yeah. And the stuff that was originally thought was it's that that IT band component right here. As you go from hitting your foot down all the way through your foot coming off, this would actually move across the lateral upper condi uh, condyle of the of the femur. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would push against that tissue, right? And that friction would cause it to become painful. I've, I've been told that before. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's been pretty thoroughly disproven. That there's not really much movement at all. Right? There's not much movement. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all, I mean, if you kind of think of it, that would be crazy. I mean, it has that you have the intermuscular septum that's controlling it, and it has multiple connections, and, like, it's not, none of those portions down by the knee are actually, like, loose. Like, yeah. so it's, like, from the whole way, it's, it's like, tension down against your femur. Yeah, so, it blends with the, the retinaculum, essentially, you know, part of the, the knee joint capsule then inserts on the, on the tibia. So it's, yeah, it's... No, I've been thinking that, like, scar tissue that was inhibiting it from moving across my lateralis, and that that scar tissue needed to be broken up so that it could move freely. I just don't see that. Yeah, I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I guess I just, I don't think that we form scar tissue that easy. Yeah. I mean, but that's, I mean, that's a, that'd be a kind of a crazy thing to be able to break up. Yeah. I mean, I think the research on adhesion formation, especially in somebody who's active and healthy and hasn't gone through a trauma like a car accident, there's not really evidence for that. What about the trauma of Ironman training? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of micro trauma, but I think that would lead to more of an overuse injury rather than a scar adhesion because you're moving so much. It's like I was going to run and like lying down for the next week to let, let that form. Get the crap beaten here. Yeah, hit with a stick. He got he got attacked with a stick. Really but, adhesions all over the place. I, I mean, I think that I think that it, you had some improvement from it though, right? Like, wasn't it like you'd have that tissue work done and you'd initially feel some improvement from it? Right. Right. Um, I I would. It would be extremely painful, but it would be able to move again kind of the next day. Um, but then again, like I don't know if it was working on the IT band or working on like the lateralis underneath. Well, that, that's kind of how I think about it, is that the, the TFL, proximally, um, you know, inserts into the, the IT band, as does the, the glute max. Um, you might have a little blending of the peroneals at the bottom, the vastus lateralis definitely connects to the fascia lata. So working on all those muscles are going to just give, you know, change the tone of your entire leg. So I think that could definitely give you a feeling of relief, and it could be helpful in the treatment to address the soft tissue you know, tone and quality around the IT band, but I don't know that you actually affect the IT band itself. I'm just not yeah. sure. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I guess the other thing is if you're somebody that's struggling with that that knee pain, I think you also have to, you absolutely have to rule out those other things that can mimic um, yeah. lateral, or not mimic, that can be painful to, to the lateral aspect of the knee. Yeah. Um, but just doing the soft tissue, Almost it's like that, you know, you create that noxious, painful stimulus. You, sometimes that shuts down your ability to feel the symptoms, too. So yeah. you take a little bit out of the equation by giving pain. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it's, and I think that's why some people really get addicted to getting massage. Like, it, because there are short-term benefits and reductions of pain. I'm not, I use manual therapy, so I'm not saying that that's a bad thing at all. Like, not at all. But um, I think as a thought process, that's why you can have people who, who have lingering symptoms for years is because you don't, you know, you don't get to uh, the actual root cause of the symptoms. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe just to sum up a little bit thus far, it's, you know, hang on the outside of the knee, you got to diagnose it right. 
Otherwise, you don't know what you're treating. Um, and that can be tricky because there's a lot of things to rule out, but it's not possible. You know, the good exam, you can do it. And then um, the pathophysiology of, of the IT band itself is still su almost surprisingly un unclear. So that makes, I think, a good exam even more important. Um, is that kind of where, where we're at? I really do think that people are, are sloppy with that component. Like, I mean, I think that's why I'm not, I'm not convinced that, that those aren't missed when we do those studies that say how often people are getting these type of symptoms. Yeah. To say that the T-band syndrome is that common, I, I think that other things that aren't actually yet are getting grouped in with that, with that mm -hmm. issue. I just don't think they're very, they're being critical with their, their testing. And that's, yeah. I, I want to jump into a second into what some of the research says about running gate mechanics and IT band syndrome, but it's almost, I was going to bring that up, is we should take it all with a grain of salt, because in almost none of these articles do they say how they diagnose the people that are in the studies. And so when I read IT band syndrome, I just think lateral knee pain. You know, I, I don't, without giving the, their diagnostic criteria, it's hard to say what they, what the people in the study were, were dealing with. Yeah. I mean, doesn't it seem like the way the way that they're currently doing it is they're saying like you have pain and you do like a like almost like a friction test, like pain at 30 degrees. Yeah. Pain with friction. that's that's typically the, the way that they're being included in the study. Yeah, I think so. I have to I mean, look that. Yeah. So I think we can get some some valuable stuff about running mechanics, but I think we, it should be taken with a grain of salt, knowing that yeah. it may be some more general the lateral knee pain, any of these pathologies. Um, so I don't know if we can switch back to a video, but kind of from my lit review, it seemed like the most common deviations we're looking at are hip adduction and internal rotation um, in the running gait. And that, to me, I see that it's the kind of rotating in that theoretically places more torsional stress over the, the components going from the hip to the lateral knee. Um, well, let me, I'll bring up another, another video then. And I know that they that like like the Ferber article and the um, I, I can never say this person's name is like Norin or something like that. Those are the two big ones that you're probably describing. Yeah. Uh, the they I, did they have people that were actively in pain or is it people who had a history of it? Um, to look back, I have them here. That's it. You see Jesse right now? You see him on the screen? Yeah. That's actually how he just wears his shorts. <laughs> I like I like to tuck him in. You yeah. know. I may have asked him to position it like that. That's not not so that's how he wears his shorts. <laughs> yeah, but he's actually having a little bit of something there right now, right? Yeah. yeah kind of just getting over I after Iron Man Arizona not that long ago, I'm kind of just getting back into training and just feel a little bit like a little bit off on my left side. Okay. Yeah. I think you can, you really can see that. I mean, let me see if I can time it so that it's right. Um, yeah. Right at the. So, mid stance. Yeah. Uh, so mid. So if we can uh, just run it through mid stance, is where we're going to see the most force going through the body. Uh, really, it's a, so a lot of times when we see breakdowns, that's where we're going to see it. That's actually pretty nice. It doesn't look like he has that much pelvic drop, Brian. Yeah, yeah. So just to break down for anybody watching who doesn't know, things we're looking for the the pelvis being, you know, pretty much parallel to the ground at mid stance, which is the point where the body is, is the lowest. It's the most impact force. And then we want to look at the yeah. angle of the, the the femur and the hip going to the knee and then to the foot. Yeah. And then for pelvis, we can look at like if the if the knee joint, you imagine where the hip joint's at, where the ankle joint's at draw a line if valgus is that knee going inside that line yeah i really like the stripes here thank you it's a really good uh decision i do what i can it makes a rough gait analysis pretty easy oh my gosh yeah i saw that real quick see how good my timing is boom yeah got it yeah nice. you can really see it there that. Same time? i mean my right hip looks dropped my Left knee looks like it's valgating in. <laughs> yeah, valgating. It's the uh, it's valgating. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And the last one on right mid stance, his shirt and those lines were, were 
parallel and now this one is is dropped i don't know sign up by 10 15 degrees or something there we go yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's significant difference. And then if you look at just the, the landmark, you get how close his knees are together. Right, that's yeah. another quick indicator of hip adduction or some internal rotation. So that's exactly what they say they were finding. Now, my issue with this is if we if we would have looked at his, before he started having symptoms again, like, so, I mean, I, I think of, when we think of running gait, I think of five things, right? So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Brian. Yeah. Um. I think of five things like so is it is there pain present and so if there's a pain present how like do i stop sharing my screen <laughs> is that is this you can see my beautiful face again all right there we go so i mean if you uh if we think of five things so if you have pain in the system i mean that yeah. could just be and then strength was the actual control somatosensory um a form of deformity uh <laughs> I'm not saying you're deformed, uh, but I think each of those can actually contribute to a, a, like a gait adjustment. So he could just be trying to run, and that may not be the yeah. real cause. Which one came before? I can tell you right now that wasn't present prior to your yeah. symptoms. So, and all of those articles are associations; they're not predictions. And so his gait could could have changed because he's feeling something on the outside of his knee. It, it might yeah. not be cause and effect. Yeah, and, and you know, so like the the gait analysis is I, unless somebody has a video of you running before, that 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 correction, I mean, telling somebody to run, I mean, and you actually see that it's one another one of the articles that we we talk about. They looked at fatigue, and they show that people will actually stop demonstrating that characteristic gait pattern associated. So like you'll actually see people start to adduct their hip less as they get fatigued with the history of IT band syndrome. And I think it's protective. I think people will try to avoid pain. They'll figure out a way to do it. Yeah, I, I saw that too, and that, that was interesting because it, it reverses what you normally see. Yeah. The only other thing that I, I was thinking of too that was shown um, with one of the MRI studies is that if you if you flex the knee to about 30 degrees, with which occurs with that internal rotation, that increases, that actually creates a uh, tensioning of the IT band across that, that, that space, that lateral recess where either a bursa, um, some people say there are no, there's no bursa, or that fat, that adipose tissues out that can become a, a painful will get lit up. And that's yeah. one of the things we've been doing looking at treatment wise is taking and using tape to force the knee to stay more externally rotated. Interesting. Which I, we found some benefit to as well, which is I, I find it interesting. I mean, I, I think I've right. written down, you could potentially try it with the deviations Jesse's showing. You could try a surf strap too. Yeah. Wow. It's actually a surf strap that made me think of it. Yeah. Because okay. I was doing it on people when they weren't, because I had somebody who wasn't showing hip adduction. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so you keep them in a little external rotation. Well, I think that's maybe just to, to close it out, talking about just some general treatment principles. Assuming that you ruled out a lot of those other things, meniscal, you know, something intracapsular, um, you know, just some general, I know we don't typically want to treat generally, but some principles that we think of when we're talking about treating this potential IT band pain or lateral knee pain. And so that's number one for me is how do we take stress off of the pain generator? And so that could be with tape, a strap, um, a running gait change, maybe running uphill rather than running downhill. There's usually more force going down. Yep. Anything else as far as taking stress off that area? I would say, I mean, the, the reducing stride length is a, is a really big one, just like what you said, reducing force. Uh, I do. I, I still do like to do tissue, especially the vastus lateralis, and that's just one of the. That's your that quad muscle on the outside. Yeah. Um, I, I really do like that. I also like going up to the TFL. The things are connected to the I to the IT band. If I really think that's a component of it. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, the whole concept of it of the IT, IT band being tight and we need to stretch it is just counterintuitive to what I'm thinking the problem is. Like I just uh, I I don't think you can stretch the IT band. I actually don't absolutely don't think you can stress stretch the distal part like the part that's closest to your knee i don't think you can stretch it you yeah. may be able to stretch it. And I, I see people come in who, who that's the first self-treatment they try and typically that that makes them worse it might make them feel better initially but those it band stretches will, will make them feel worse i mean if we think it's tensioning i mean you're literally tensioning it across the the painful part so it makes no sense um but those are, I mean, those are the initial big things that we, that I would say we do, but, you know, 
Oh, I mean, the biggest thing for me is long term. It's like thinking of it as a long term problem, right? Yeah. So, like, how do you make it so that that doesn't come back? And and I just think of that generally, especially with runners or triathletes, of how do we improve their ability to manage force and load long term? You know, I think there was one study that showed increase in knee flexion with fatigue and people with the, the IT band syndrome and lateral knee pain. And to me, that's with fatigue, they have a worse ability to to eccentrically control their body weight. Um, and so that's why where Jesse said strength training really helps. And to me, that, that says we're just improving your body's ability to manage the loading of running. Yeah. I think um, the nail that, yeah. You know, looking at it with a long-term view and and not looking at this current season. Yeah, we manage the pain now, but then do you want it to come back? And if you, and if you want it to come back, then just keep doing what you're doing. But if, if you don't, uh, I mean, I think it's approaching it in a different way, which is more, you know, address all the other issues. And that's why I think some of these studies aren't consistent because everybody's not the same. You know, I think, I think in research, we try to keep, we try to act like everyone is the same. But I don't think with some of this lateral knee pain, it's the same, it's actually the same problems that are driving the symptoms. Yeah. So as long as you take it, take out the thing that's causing the pain now, but then look to the future on how you can make it go away long term i think that's the way to go yeah um i have one one other question is because i hear this a lot too of people who've gone to you know running shoe stores or something when they've been dealing with knee pain and they want to get new shoes to see if it helps almost always somebody will be told that they're they're over pronating or something and that's causing their it band syndrome all of those bucket terms uh do you do you see though like a, a distal component at the foot um cause playing into the lateral knee. I'm, I mean, I find that hard to separate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like one, one's causing the other because of, I mean, obviously I think both things can have a contribution. Yeah. I think typically it's hip is much more the component, like what's happening at the hip and then what type of, uh, of uh, stride mechanics they're showing. Like if they're over striding, which yeah. is different, real striking, which is different than like midfoot or forefoot striking. Like if they're actually, taking too large a stride, which maybe it's over, overloading the structure. Yeah. But uh, I'm not sure. I mean, did you have any success with the shoe change? Um, I mean, if my shoes are extremely worn out, and that can I, – but I think it's just kind of taking some of the stress off. Yeah. Like if I have nice, new, soft, squishy shoes, then it's taking a little bit of, like, that load out of, like, how my foot's hitting the ground. Yeah. So. And, I guess very short-term success in getting a brand new pair of shoes with a little bit extra bounce. Um, yeah, like running in vans. <laughs> exactly. Well, if I get like a, a nice pair of flip-flops and I go running down. I think, I think they make a, a shoe that's marketed towards IT band syndrome with a bunch of springs in the heel. <laughs> <I'm not kidding. laughs> Seriously? I think that exists. Well, yeah. I mean, that's like... <laughs> That's funny. I mean, that's. A, I, I think with the shoe, I don't 100 percent think we understand everything that's happening when we put shoes on. Like the, I was having this conversation the other day that like Hoka's, for example, like with the thick sole. Like I don't think, I don't, I don't know if it's that it has more cushioning that that's why. Yeah. What I've noticed, especially when filming and, and recording gait, like stride length, what I'm thinking happens is people naturally shorten their stride. Yeah, because they're walking on a <laughs> foam or something. Yeah, walking on marshmallow. You know, so it's kind of a cool shoe in that in that arena. Like I, I mean, if it takes away your symptoms, I mean, how do you argue with that? Like if somebody comes in and they're like, "Dude, this took away my symptoms," I'm not gonna try to convince them that that makes no sense. Yeah, I'm probably gonna try to understand why. As I'm not 100 percent sure if if it's because that feedback system, that feed forward system, to tell you how to run. Yeah, it can become drastically changed. You know, if the sensation you're getting from the shoe is changing how you move. So yeah, and so, I mean. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I think I agree. I mean, almost any running shoe store will tell somebody they're over pronating, but I think the ability to control that is, is really tough. And the ability of a shoe or an arch support it is hard. And so I think make sure you have adequate calf strength, peroneal strength, you know, good balance, good reactive control at the ankle. But then I think you got to look to the hip, um, to the hamstrings, the glutes. I think that's a bigger driver. Than, than pronating. Yeah, and I think that's going to take a whole nother thing, but I mean, I don't think that overpronating period is, a, right. is that big of an issue. So, and that's something that, that, uh, have you, have you been having ankle pain? Um, no, but I, any, <laughs> any <laughs> not, uh, 
<laughs> have to get on the treadmill again. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think the shoot can be important, but I think the other stuff's more important. Yeah, yeah. The shoot can be another por uh, portion of the, of the puzzle that, that could be important, but we need to understand some other stuff too. Well, yeah, first understand the diagnosis and then, you know, get a good treatment strategy, a good long-term strategy, make sure the running gate mechanics, you know, some subtle changes, but nothing crazy. And then maybe look at the foot as a last, a last piece. Last yeah. thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to add? Um, you know, not really. I think that every runner can benefit from getting, getting their gait analyzed before they actually get hurt. Yeah. Um, and this, this is a perfect example why, because it'll, it'll tell us if you're dealing with something that's been a permanent gait pattern um, yeah. or something that's, that's, that's new. You know, the, the more you run, the more you do activity, you know, the more exposures, the higher, the higher probability that you're going to have an injury. So if you get that, get that tested before, it's just, a, it just makes correcting the problem much easier. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. Jesse, have you, you said you've been doing a lot of weight training, which I've done a little bit with you down there. Uh, I know a lot of endurance athletes are scared of getting too, too bulky or, or heavy. Have you, have you experienced that or, or what would be your response to that? Just general comment. Um, how much does the wife like the new body? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that, um, on a whole, I've, I've lost weight strength training. Um, I, I think it, I don't know if like, it's hard cause it's also kind of come at the same time when I'm increasing my overall training volume. Yeah. Um, and so when I'm doing that, it might just be like, it's, it's a calorie deficit that's hard to keep up with. Yeah. Um, and I think that, I mean, I think that strength training is also like a, a pretty high, like caloric cost, um, that can be hard to account for, especially when it's the end of like a long day of training. Yeah. Um, but I mean, just to answer your question in a very short manner, yeah. I find that it's very hard to gain weight as far as like muscle mass. Like you have to be trying to do that. And I don't, I, I think that people are scared of that for really no real reason, especially if they're maintaining any type of like run or like bike volume yeah. to just say, Oh, if I go to the gym twice a week for like 45 minutes, I'm going to blow up and be huge. Yeah. Is kind of like, if you said that to someone who's like a professional bodybuilder, yeah, you could laugh at that. Yeah. They would laugh at you. Um, because I mean, they're trying very hard, but you know, yeah. multiple hours every day to gain muscle mass. It's not just something that like slips and falls on your arms. Yeah. I, I couldn't put it, put it better. Yeah. I think it's, especially I've gotten guys who run in hundred miles a week and they're worried about gaining weight. I'm like, you have to, you're, you have to be in such a calorie surplus to do that, that, that your, your stomach wouldn't be able to handle getting, getting the calories in to gain weight. hundred miles a that's a that's a cockroach. I mean, anybody that can survive 100 miles away, you're a cockroach. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Well, thanks, guys. I think that was a good talk on, on IT band stuff. I mean, it's a, it, mild knee pain can be tough to treat, but getting a good diagnosis and then taking a long term approach, I mean, it's totally manageable. I think Jesse, you're you're a good case study for that while maintaining high volume, uh, good good race results. So. Yeah, I think it's a good start. I think this is something that we'll we'll keep doing. We'll keep having some of these talks and yeah, these anybody's watching and they they want to hear about something, just drop it in the comments or shoot us an email. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thanks, guys.